Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to today's lecture. My name is Daniel Philpot, and I am director of the Center for Civil and Human Rights. CCHR is pleased to host this year's Klein's Chair in Judicial Ethics on behalf of Notre Dame Law School. Notre Dame Law School's Klein's Chair in Judicial Ethics was established with a gift from Judge James J. Klein's Jr., who was graduated from Notre Dame in 1945 with his bachelor's degree in economics and from Cornell University with his law degree in 1948. He was a partner in the Ithaca, New York firm Harris, Beach, and Wilcox, a city attorney and prosecutor, and the Ithaca city judge from 1969 to 1989. Previous holders of the Klein's chair include Judge John T. Noon Noonan Jr. from the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and Supreme Court Chief Justice Rehnquist and Associate Justice Antonin Scalia, who held the chair twice. As this year's Klein's chair, we are pleased to have Eduardo Ferrer McGregor, judge of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. His lecture is entitled, What Do We Talk About When We Talk About Judicial Dialogue? Reflections from a Judge of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Before I introduce him, let me invite everyone to a reception after the lecture immediately in Eck Commons, just above us on the second floor. Let me also thank Notre Dame Law School for its sponsorship of the Klein's Chair, Kevin Fry for his work in organizing today's lecture, and Professor Doug Castle for moderating and helping to translate the question and answer session afterwards. <coughs> Judge Eduardo Ferrer McGregor was elected to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights by the Organization of American States for the period of 2013 to 2018. The Mexican government congratulated him for this achievement, describing him as one who brings together the necessary conditions of his solid academic credentials and extensive experience in human rights. Judge and Professor Ferrer is an eminent legal scholar with the Juridical Research Institute at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, with expertise in constitutional procedure and international law. He has his doctorate in law from the University of Navarre in Spain. With his main academic home in Mexico, where he teaches undergraduates and postgraduates, Judge Ferrer has served as a visiting professor at over 20 universities and institutes spanning the United States and the Americas, I should say, the Americas and Europe. He has received numerous honors. A prize in human rights dissemination was established in his name by the Mexican state of Nuevo Leon in 2012. Judge Ferrer is the author of dozens of books, monographs, and articles on a wide variety of human top rights topics, including jurisprudence on military jurisdiction and human rights, conventionality control, and the scourge of femicide in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. We are fortunate to have had him with us over the last two weeks and are grateful for his three seminars on the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court on the death penalty, forced disappearances, and amnesty laws. During his visit, organized by the Center for Civil and Human Rights, Judge Ferrer has generously shared his time and insights about human rights with the law school and broader Notre Dame communities in class visits and numerous conversations with students and faculty. So thank you, Judge Ferrer. Now I'm, I would ask you to join me in warmly welcoming Judge Ferrer. Well, thank you very much uh, for your kind introduction, um, Director of the Center for Civil and Human Rights, uh, Professor Daniel Felpert. Um, dear professors, students, members of the University of Notre Dame, 
It is with great pleasure that today I deliver the Kleinest Chair Lecture on Judicial Ethics. I feel honored to share some insights about the phenomenon of judicial dialogue from my experience of, as a judge of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights to the academic community, to the University of Notre Dame, a leading university in the world with an outstanding commitment towards the implementation and effectiveness of human rights. I would like to express my immense gratitude to the Center, to the Center for Civil and Human Rights for this appointment and the faculty, and the warm hospitality. Thank you very much, Director of the Center. Thank you, Watarin. Uh, then, also thanks uh, Chris, uh, Christine, Shan, Kevin, Jody, Matthew, and of course my gratitude to the law, the faculty uh, uh, of the, for, for the opportunity to teach here for the past two weeks. I will never, never forget this experience. Definitely I won't forget my morning walks by the lakes in these sunny days. The visit to the Grotto and the Basilica, the marvelous law library that you have, and the rich academic uh, life of the university, especially uh, the dialogue that I had the chance to have with professors and students. I also had the opportunity in the past days to attend extraordinary public talks at the Hesburgh Center and Kellogg's Institute for International Studies. I would like uh, to say thanks especially to professor, professors Paolo Carolsa and Doug Castle for the rich dialogue that we had. And finally, I would like to say thanks to Roger. I don't see you, Roger. Yes, he's over there. Professor Roger Alford to let me use his bike. He was very <laughs> important for me in these beautiful days to enjoy campus. And thank you all to be here. I really felt the spirit of Notre Dame during these weeks. I feel <clears throat> and hope that from now on, in some way, I'm part of the fighting Irish of Notre Dame. <laughs> um, as I already mentioned, today I will reflect on one of the most innovative features of judicial relations in the 21st century, the phenomenon of judicial dialogue among courts of different jurisdictions, both at the domestic and international level. There is ample literature that has documented the way in which this phenomenon has developed and that could certainly serve as the first components of a general theory on judicial dialogue. However, little has been said by the main users of this technique, the judges themselves. It is with this perspective that today I would like to draw your attention. I will try to provide my own perspective on the phenomenon and share some reflections as an active participant in this dialogue. But before doing this, I consider it important to establish some preliminary considerations. The first consideration is that we are facing globalization, and with this phenomenon we are seeing the erosion of frontiers. Globalization has transformed the traditional concept of sovereignty and has modified the way in which national and international affairs interact among each other. Some have even argued the existence of an irreversible legal globalization characterized by multiple institutions and legal instruments which rapidly interact among domestic structures. In this phenomenon, judges assume a relevant role as they are in charge of the effective application of international legal instrument and we are in constant interaction with international institutions. Also, immediate interconnectivity between actors at the domestic and international levels is a fundamental characteristic of contemporary relations. Technology has provided the necessary tools to have instant communication, and globalization has increased <coughs> the interest for international matters. As the current state of affairs demonstrate, isolation seems to be contrary to the modus operandi of our times. The second consideration that I would like to establish is on the meaning of judicial dialogue. This, cause, this concept has been related to different aspects of the practices of international courts and tribunals, and even among quasi-juridictional organisms that made use 
of criteria created in other forums to define the scope of certain rights. Some have argued that judicial dialogue relates to conversation among the judiciary in various topics. Others define it as an argumentative technique uh, to inquire in new topics. In a very more restrictive way, it has been argued that true judicial dialogue only occurs in very limited circumstances and that the majority of episodes identified as such are in reality just an exercise of comparative law. A more flexible understanding establishes that periodical meetings among judges and the exchange of personal can also be identified as judicial dialogue. This panorama provides wide and different perspectives on what is judicial dialogue, but it is possible to identify common denominators. First, judicial dialogue re relates to openness, to look beyond one's own frontiers as means of communication among courts and tribunals. Second, participants engage in the judicial dialogue in absolute freedom and presupposes equally among them. Third, the notion of judicial dialogue presupposes the existence of a direct channel of communication among judges without intermediaries. It is also important to mention that there are plenty of reasons to engage in a judicial dialogue. Perhaps one of the most important is the possibility to, to be inspired or to take ideas for the resolution of a concrete legal situation. These are, of course, considerations that are not based on a defined theory, but the, re the, but the reason for this is that judicial dialogue is a phenomenon that originates in a judicial practice, condition that leads to a third consideration. Judicial dialogue is a developing process in an early stage and will continue to de develop in the years to come with special intensity on human rights. Certainly, the field of human rights is one of the most interesting to explore the phenomenon of judicial dialogue, and one of the main reasons is the functional and normative identity among courts and tribunals, both national and international, which have promoted openness to the use of foreign precedents. In other words, human rights provide a unique and very rich empirical field for judicial dialogue analysis. With this background, background, I will divide my presentation in three main parts. First, judicial cosmopolitanism and judicial dialogue. Second, the practice of judicial dialogue with a special reference of the dialogue that has occurred between the Inter-American Court and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and between the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and some domestic courts in Latin America. Third, and last, I will refer to some ancillary aspects of judicial dialogue, including some ideas about the reconfiguration of the judicial function and the future, and the future of this technique in human rights. Based on these considerations, the main objective on this lecture is to promote a debate for a joint analysis and conversation, in other words, to invite you all to engage in this dialogue. Now let's go to the first part, judicial cosmopolitanism and judicial dialogue. Since the early 90s, there has been an increasing role in the work of international courts and tribunals, as we can testify for the establishment of ad hoc international criminal courts and the entry into force of the Rome Statute, uh, inaugurating the judicial function of the Interna International Criminal Court in 2001. Since then, there has been an increment in the docket of already existing international courts and tribunals. The settlement of disputes through international judicial mechanism is a positive sign, but we must remain aware about the possibility that the same issues can be decided by multiple judicial organs or that international legal instruments can be applied by a number of courts and tribunals. For example, it is possible that an international court on human rights in order to de determine the scope of the obligation applicable during an international armed conflict, apply international provisions on humanitarian law that have already been developed by the specialized tribunals on international criminal law, 
to determine the scope of the obligations applicable during an international armed conflict. It might be the case, as well, that an international court with an ample competence to decide on international disputes among states has to decide upon the application of provisional provisions enshrined in international human rights treaties that have already been interpreted by the specialized tribunal, tribunals on human rights. Therefore, the increasing role of the international judi judiciary increases the possibilities that the international instruments are applied by a number of international courts and tribunals. The expansion of the, of the role of international courts and tribunals has been accompanied by another element. The increasing activity of domestic, domestic judges vis-a-vis -vis international law. At the domestic level, we are testifying the enlargement ratione materia of international law as it currently regulates matters that were previously regulated exclusively in the domestic legal order. This new area in the relationship of international law and domestic law is very positive as well, since domestic judges are entrusted with the application and development of international norms, so when they exercise these functions, there is a functional and normative identity with their international colleagues. International law certainly allows, promotes, promotes and requires direct application of international norm in different degrees. So when domestic courts apply international norms, they are truly applying, interpreting and developing international law. These competences of enforcing international law can be exercised through different means. When domestic law complies with an international norm, or when domestic law is applied but in substance reflect an international obligation, or when international law is applied in order to interpret domestic law that has to be in conformity with international law. In these areas, domestic courts act as natural judges of international law and are the ones who are going to interpret and apply the rules of international law before a legal matter reaches the international level. Therefore, there is a nationalization in or in some cases, a constitutionalization of international law. And so we can say that in these cases, a national judge becomes a sort of international judge. With this function and normative identity, some questions arise in practice, uh, such as many international and national courts and tribunals develop common tasks at the same time. One may ask, what would be the consequence if each court, the domestic and the international, reaches a different conclusion, even a contradictory conclusion? What is at, uh, what, what is at, uh, at, at risk is a legal certainty about the scope of international obligations that are binding upon states. From a different perspective, when there is a functional and normative identity among different jurisdictions, coherence and normative integration are very desirable since inconsistency might create uncertainty about the precise scope of the legal obligation that in the long term might undermine the international legal system. If more and more courts and tribunals apply a specific norm of international law in the same way, international provisions will have more legitimacy, improving the legal certainty about their normative force. This does not entail of course, that every judge at every moment has to apply international law in the same way. On the contrary, normative coherence through legal integration requires that every factual citation and every interpretation and application of international law is treated, is treated as a, a unique case. But when uh, there is freedom, but even when there is freedom for judges, for domestic judges to decide not to follow a precedent created by an international court and tribunal, I think that any discrepancy has to be duly explained, contextualized, and justified. Judicial dialogue, dialogue has been identified as one of the mechanisms that promotes integration and normative coherence. 
uh, as it facilitates integration of international law, raising awareness about the developments and jurisprudence rendered by other tribunals. Through judicial dialogue, the judiciary, whether international or national, can take a decision based upon the previous knowledge of the jurisprudence rendered by other colleagues of the, on the same topics. Judicial dialogue has provided more understanding about the environment in which judges operate and has enhanced uh, attentiveness to a global community where everybody contributes to the, to the development of the system. In this context, it's very important to highlight that judicial dialogue does not entail complete and absolute uniformity or even homogenization in each and every case. In a dialogue, discrepancies and diversity in the criteria are allowed and even rewarded. However, any disagreement, as we already said, has to be fully explained. This is particularly important in the field of human rights since the protection of human dignity is at stake. In this sense, judicial dialogue is one of the judicial signs of our times, and cosmopolitan spirit identifies it, since judges are no longer immersed in their own spirit, spirit, sphere because the five continents face similar problems. And this is more relevant when it comes of, uh, to human rights in a globalized world. As I mentioned before, we have not yet built a complete general theory on how this dialogue should occur, but the dialogue is already happening uh, uh, with the uh, operational and framework that I just referred. I will now uh, turn to the analysis of how the Inter-American Court has implemented this technique over the years. Uh, for the practice of the Inter-American Court, there are two aspects of the judicial dialogue that I would uh, uh, like to focus on. The judicial dialogue that exists be between the Inter-American Court and the European Court of Human Rights, and the dialogue undertaken between the Inter-American Court and some courts and tribunals in Latin America. Even if both aspects of judicial dialogue prov uh, provide perspectives of the same phenomenon, they have different characteristics. To analyze both, uh, uh, both aspects, aspects is equivalent to analyze two faces of the same coin. Nevertheless, both aspects has, have contributed in a crucial way to the institutional development of the Inter-American Court as well as to, as to the establishment of legal doctrines in Latin America, for example, the conventionality control, as we will see further on. This endeavor represents a novelty since both sides have been studied and analyzed separately. I consider that an overview of the practice of a judicial dialogue in these two perspectives is very important to understand the mission and function of the courts at present time. So that's why we now move to the second part of my presentation, which is the practice of judicial dialogue by the Inter-American Court of, of Human Rights. Since the moment in which the Inter-American Court of Human Rights uh, started its function in 1979, it decided to cultivate contact and interaction with the European Court. This effort, as described by the former president of the Inter-American Court, Thomas Burgenthal, was evidenced by the fact that the vice president of the European Court attended the inaugural session of the Inter-American Court. Afterwards, both tribunals decided to hold periodical meetings both in San Jose and Strasbourg. In fact, in a few weeks, we, uh, in a few weeks both courts will hold a meeting in Strasbourg. That will be in the third uh, week of, uh, we're in October now, no? yes, in two or uh, three weeks. At that time, this is in 1979, the situation in Latin America was disastrous in the sense that various countries in the region engaged in systematic and grave violations of human rights. During the Cold War, military and the, the, the dictatorial uh, regimes, the territorial regimes in Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, Bolivia, Chile, and Uruguay, committed torture and enforced disappearance in order to fight political opponents. The situation was not different in Central America, and with, few, and, and with just few exceptions on the continent, the distinct mark in a great number of countries was the massive violations of human rights. 
When the Inter-American Court started to decide contentious cases, it did not hesitate to uh, relay abundantly to the European jurisprudence. The reason for, for this use might be that the beginning of its work, it just, it just uh, had confidence in a jurisprudence with an uncontested authority and legitimacy. In those early years, when the Inter-American Court was facing a very important period of legitimization and validation, its European counterpart had already established a solid path. So, in the early cases of the Inter-American Court, it is possible to find constant reference to the decision of the European Court. As a consequence, one can testify that the Inter-American Court has constantly referred to the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court in an ample range of topics. I can firmly say that recourse to the jurisprudence of the European Court has been done to promote the development of the Court's own jurisprudence, whether rendered in contentious proceedings or advisory opinions, to support the Court's own criteria and to enrich the opinion of judges, rendered in dissenting or concurring opinions. With this spirit in mind, I would like to refer to some topics in which the Inter-American Court has taken recourse to the European experience. The, po the topics are just a selection in no particular order to, uh, ta uh, that try to exemplify the role of judicial dialogue in the development of the Inter-American Court jurisprudence. For that reason, my reference do not pretend to be exhaustive. First example, forced disappearance of persons. One of the issues that have been on the agenda of, of the Inter-American Court since the beginning of its work in forced disappearances, in fact, the first contentious case decided by the court, the case of Velázquez Rodríguez versus Honduras, 1988, was connected with this phenomenon. In this respect, the Inter-American Court made recourse to the European jurisprudence in order to reinforce the decision to establish the pluri-offensive character of disappearances, as well as the con conceptualization of the multiple interconnected and criminal elements of the crime. Based on this, the court has concluded that the constitutive elements of forced disappearance are, first, deprivation of liberty, second, the direct involvement of state agents or their uh, acquiescence, and third, the refusal to acknowledge the detention and disclose the fate or whereabouts of the disappeared person, acknowledge the detention and disclosure of the fate. In a recent case against Peru, the Inter-American Court had to analyze a aberration of forced disappearance in which local authorities allegedly, allegedly uh, re released someone who had been reported as having disappeared as a state practice to keep secret uh, the real location of the individual. When the court analyzed the facts of the case and the novel circumstances to establish Peru's responsibility, it referred to a similar example in a case before the European Court. Second example, right to life. Regarding the protection to the right to life, the Inter-American Court has imported the criteria of its European counterpart established that an arbitrary deprivation of life occurs when there is a violation of the judicial guarantees uh, of an accused that leads to the imposition of the death penalty sentence. The violation of the judicial guarantees might entail the deprivation of the necessary and adi adequate means of his defense. The court has incorporated, as well, the criteria that the use of lethal force by state agents must be absolutely necessary in order to be legal. And this necessity is not met, is not, uh, met when the individual in question does not represent a direct danger. Security forces of the states have to abstain from the use of lethal force if it is a result in a, even if it is, uh, if it, if this result in a missed opportunity to apprehend an individual. Third, uh, third example, due process guarantees. Regarding the enforcement of judgment by domestic courts, the European criterion has been applied in its full context by the Inter-American Court. This criteria establishes that this stage constitutes an integral part of the proceedings and that state's full fulfillment with a court judgment has to be done 
within reasonable time. For, for instance, recourse to the jurisprudence of the European Court has been done in order to determine the relationship between respect for civil and political rights and economic and social rights and reasonable time as a judicial guarantee. In accordance with the jurisprudence of the European Court, uh, whenever a court has determined the obligation of the state to investigate, this obligation increases taking into account the health and the age of the applicant. Regarding the presumption of innocence, the uh, Court of San Jose has incorporated the criteria that declarations of state's authorities to the press about the criminal responsibility of an, an individual who has been accused and is, and is still subject to a criminal proceeding, undermining his presumption of innocence and constituting a violation of due process guarantees. Taking into full extent the jurisprudence of the European Court, the Court in San Jose has established that the presumption of innocence demands absolute discretion from state authorities as well as reasonableness when they make public declarations on criminal proceedings still awaiting sentence. It is worth mentioning that the jurisprudence clearly establishes that compliance with these obligations do not constitute an impediment to maintain the population well informed. For, for example, expulsions of aliens. Regarding due process guarantees that regulate expulsions of aliens from national territory, the Inter-American Court has applied to a large extent the corpus juris of the European system of human rights in order to determine the guarantees against uh, arbitrary expulsions, including the procedural uh, that has to be observed for uh, uh, asylum seekers and refugees. One of the most important obligations by the states is that they have the obligation to undertake a complete investigation of the risks and dangers that individual, individual face in their, and they are, when they are expelled, deported, or returned to their countries of ori origin, as well as the respect for family rights in proceeding that result in the expulsion of underage persons and their parents. Particularly regarding family rights, the creation adopted by the court in San Jose has determined that even if an aspect request for asylum has not been presented in favor for a child or adolescent, the state has to pay due attention to the migratory status and conditions. States have the obligation to observe at all times the best interest of the child as well as the principle of non-refoulement and family union. Respect uh, for these principles required that all authorities at the Immigration Department of the State undertake a diligent full investigation to exhaust all mechanisms to receive all relevant information that provide the necessary information to decide on the migratory status of the underage in question. More recently, just three weeks ago, in the advisory opinion 21-14 on the rights and guarantees of children in the context, context of migration and or in need to international protection, the court decided that guarantees to due process apply to any person regardless of their age and migratory status in a country. In this regard, the court uh, stipulated that due process of law is a right that must be guaranteed to everybody, to everyone, irrespective to their migratory status, which means that the state must guarantee that any alien, even an immigrant in an irregular situation, has the possibility of asserting the, his rights and defending his interests Effective, effectively and in condition to procedural equality with other justiciables. Fifth example, prohibition to non-discrimination. In the case Gonzalez y otros Campo Algodonero versus Mexico, related to the femicides, that is homicides on gender, gender basis, in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, the Inter-American Court took the criteria of the European Court that gender-based violence constitute a form of discrimination against women. In a case against Turkey, the European Court had determined that the failure to the state to protect women against domestic violence 
constitute a violation of the right to equal protection of the law, and that state's failure did not necessarily have to be intentional to constitute a violation to the European Convention. In the same, in the same sense, the Inter-American Court has imported as well the, no, the notion of, in, of indirect discrimination, establishing that when a particular public policy or practice has a disproportional detrimental effect in a particular group, that a policy can be considered a discriminatory measure even if it wasn't directed at a specific group. After this, uh, Bureau over, Bureau, after this uh, Bureau over, overview of the judicial dialogue between Strasbourg and San Jose, from the perspective and experience of the Inter-American Court, one might wonder if to some extent the Tribunal of San Jose has influence in the European jurisprudence. In order to answer this question, it is necessary to mention that after more than 35 years of judicial activities of the Inter-American Court, the court has consolidated its own jurisprudence. This has certainly no pass or notice by the European Court, and the role of this jurisprudence has played a very relevant, uh, particularly after the enlargement of the European system, which made the European Court face cases that occurred in countries of Eastern Europe and that were similar to situations uh, faced by the Inter-American Court. Some examples demonstrate the navigation of the standards of the Inter-American Court through the Atlantic. Well, that looks like a Titanic, but <laughs> that's about that picture. I will put a, an airplane, a big airplane next time. <laughs> I don't like that picture, but... Well, well regarding force disappearances, the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court inspired the European Court <coughs> to deviate from a previous approach. When the European Court first decided on a case related to policy disappearances, the tribunal refused to condemn the state for a violation to the right to life, which had already occurred at the Inter-American level. Since, in accordance with the European Court, there was no irrefutable proof about the death of the victim. But in a more recent decision, the European Court condemned the state for violation of both substantive and procedural obligations derived from the right to life, as it assumed that for the simple pass of the time the victim could be considered dead, applying the inter-American criteria. In the same sense, the European Court has considered that the poor disappearance constitutes a, a, a violation of rights protected by the, the European Convention. This interpretation has granted jurisdiction to both tribunals in cases that relate to disappearance that occurred before the acceptance of the court's jurisdiction by the states. In the same way, in 2009, in the case Soloto versus Russia, the European Court, after analyze, analyzing its own jurisprudence regarding the principle of no, not be seen in them, concluded that it is Previous interpretation provided a narrow scope of protection than the protection granted by other international organisms, including the Inter-American Court, and decided to adopt a broader scope of protection. The, the European Court has referred to the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court in an ample range of matters, including the scope of states' positive, positive obligations, the binding force of provisional measures to protect the merits of a case, the principle of the most favorable criminal law, the non-prosecution of civilians before military courts, solitary uh, confinement, inhuman treatment, restrictions regarding the death penalty, and, in a, and even in a very recent case, that is Marcus versus Croatia, Croatia, May 27, 2014, the European Court widely used the case law of the Inter-American Court on the evaluation of amnesties. With these examples, it is possible to have a general idea about the dialogue between the two tribunals. It is true that the richness of the European jurisprudence incorporated by the Inter-American Court cannot be compared in quantitative terms to the ample jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court incorporated by the European Court, as there are being historical, material, and structural reasons that have an impact 
on the differences between both tribunals. For instance, at the present time, the Inter-American Court has only rendered judgment on about 175 cases in contentious, contentious proceedings. And the judges of the Inter-American Court do not work on full-time basis, nor live in San Jose. That's why I'm here. <laughs> on the other hand, the European Court has decided almost 1,000 cases last year alone. Last year alone. Their judges work full-time in Strasbourg, and their financial and operational capacity is much higher than of the Inter-American Court. Let's move on the next type of dialogue. Now I would like to turn to a different perspective of uh, the judicial dialogue, the dialogue undertaken by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and domestic courts and tribunals in Latin America. As mentioned before, at the beginning of the activities of the Inter-American Court, the respect and protection of human rights in various states in Latin America was in great danger. However, uh, during the late 80s and early 90s, there was a change of uh, paradigm since many states of the region suffered radical changes in their dictatorships and military regimes were replaced by the democratic governments. And these conditions affect the domestic legal order as well. Many states embrace an open attitude towards the recognition and implementation of international human rights and to provide a, a counter mechanism against the abuses of power by the states that have uh, reigned during many years. This paradigmatic change implied, among other measures, comprehensive legal reforms that included the recognition of international human rights at the domestic level. This allowed the materialization of international legal values within state in Latin America. Values that are based on the understand about the necessity to respect the dignity of all individuals. Hence, the constitution of several countries established a, pri a privileged position to human rights norm in their domestic legal system. It was reflected in the establishing, establishment of clause, clauses of openness and clauses of interpretation, which in some cases even consider that international human rights will prevail over the domestic legal, legal order, even over the constitution. With this new legal framework, the role of domestic judges has modified and expanded as well. Some have even argued that the specificity of uh, human rights provisions in Latin America constitutions is nowadays one of its most important characteristics. The, the, the new democratic area led to a new chapter in the relationship between domestic courts and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Of course, this does not entail that the powers of the competence granted to the Inter-American Court has been increased or expanded, nor that the powers and attribution of domestic courts have been reduced. Rather, the new era is characterized by the fact that both domestic courts and the international tribunals were committed to, uh, to achieve the same ends, that is, the integral protection of human rights through state action. I can say it without hesitation that that was the precise moment in which the judicial dialogue in the region began to flourish. In this sense, the judicial dialogue in the region aims to effectively deploy the Inter-American Corpus Juris, which would be constituted of a combination of norms and principles that exist in the regional, regional human rights instruments and uh, that are now part of the domestic legal order of the state. It also entails a set of rules of procedure in which the Inter-American Court plays a crucial role in the establishment of the applicable criteria of uh, primus inter pares. That means the dialogue that occurs in the region is vertical and based on respect, independence, and reciprocity among the different courts and tribunals. To provide further explanations on these characteristics, I will elaborate further on the way in which the dialogue has developed and evolved during the past years. So let's move on from judicial dialogue to the conventionality control. As mentioned before, 
the court, uh, the core elements of the judicial dialogue in Latin America is the phenomenon of incorporation at the domestic level that some uh, times had led, led to a constitutionalization of international and regional human rights law, condition that has opened the door for the enforcement of the most favorable standards of protection to individuals. With the openness of constitutional law to international law, do domestic judges have the obligation to apply the highest standard of protection. By in, uh, undertaking this uh, task, judges take into account not only the international or regional provision of human rights, but also the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. This vertical approach is one of the most important characteristics of the judicial dialogue in the region and has four different levels of intensity. In the minimal level of intensity, it is possible to identify states members of the Organization of American States that have not signed the American Convention of Human Rights and, have, uh, and, and also have not recognized the compulsory jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court. Within this minimum level of intensity, we identified 10 countries, United States, Canada, and most of the English-speaking states of the Caribbean. On the second level of intensity, which may be described as a low le uh, level of intensity, we find states that have signed and ratified the American Convention, but haven't accepted the compulsory juris jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court. Within this level, we find three Caribbean countries, Jamaica, Dominica, and Grenada. On the third level of intensity, which we might describe as a medium level of intensity, we consider states that have accepted the compulsory jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court in the past, but that have denounced the American Convention. In this medium level of intensity, we identified Trinidad and Tobago, which denounced the Convention in 1999, and very recently, Venezuela, who denounced the American Convention in 2013. We consider that in these cases, there is a, me a medium level of intensity in the judicial dialogue because the, den the notion of the American Convention should not have the effect of releasing the state party concerned from the obligation contained in this convention, the American Convention, with respect to any act that may constitute a violation of those obligations and that has been taken by that state prior to the effective date of denunciation, denunciation, as it is established in Article 78 of the American <coughs> Convention. And that's why the Inter-American Court maintains the jurisdiction even after the denunciation of the treaty. At the fourth level of intensity, which is the maximum level, we identified 20 states who have signed and ratified the American Convention and have accepted the compulsory jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court. On this level of high intensity is where judicial dialogue in the region is abundant and very productive. It is worth noting that the 20 states within this level are states that share similar characteristics. Almost all of them are speaking uh, Spanish-speaking countries not all of them, Brazil, there's 16 of them, 16 of them, that uh, and share a tradition of 200 years of constitutionalism that is manifested on the rise and shrine in their constitutional instruments and the guarantees for their protection, and also are open minded, open minded, more or less, towards the incorporation of international human rights law, especially regarding the regional, regional instruments of the Inter-American Corpus Juris. This last element is reflected in the constitution provisions of various states in the region, as well as in the judgment rendered by domestic tribunals of the highest hierarchy, Supreme Courts or Constitutional Courts. A, parad a, parad a parad paradigmatic example of the openness towards international human rights law is the political constitution of Argentina of 1994, that, it, that in its Article 75 establishes a list of instruments of human rights, including the American Convention, which in accordance to the condition of its entering into force, have constitutional hierarchy, do not derogate any of the articles 
on the first part of the Constitution and have to be understood as complementary to the rights and obligations enshrined <coughs> in the Convention. The Supreme Court of Argentina has clearly emphasized that the interpretation of the, Inter -American, of the American Convention the interpretation of the American Convention has to be guided by the jurisprudence rendered by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, as this is the original tribunal established to uh, provide uh, authoritative interpretation of the Pact of San Jose. The case of Colombia and its constitutional court is relevant in this uh, sense as well. The constitutional court established that the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court is cons considered a crucial source that has to be observed when it interprets the Constitution and it is applicable in full extent alongside the legal sources that are implemented by legal actors. Nowadays, a great number of courts in Latin America have shown a wide openness towards the incorporation of the Inter-American Court juries in their national legal system in a similar manner than Argentina and Colombia. Yet, it is very important to recall that even if the level, level of constitutionalization of international and regional human, human rights instruments is relevant to promote the acceptance of international standards at the domestic level, this does not constitute the crucial factor regarding the existence of an obligation to comply with international law. In the absence of domestic provisions, uh, promoting such incorporation, some judges have showed great audacity and applied foreign precedents in order to provide a high standard of protection in the case at hand. In other words, the relevant factor to promote the acceptance of international law and the jurisprudence rendered by international tribunals is the judge's attitude. When embarking on, on this proactive attitude, one can determine that the judge, judge have accepted the standard as a consequence of an urgent necessity to provide coherent interpretation of international law that allowed a better protection of human rights. Now, um, let's go to the doctrine of the conventionality control. After the Inter-American Court uh, became fully aware of the tendency of the constitutionalism of human rights in the region and of the acceptance of its jurisprudence as a hermeneutic element guiding the interpretation of the American Convention, the court established the obligation of domestic judges to exercise some kind of judicial review of domestic laws. In the exercise of their judicial endeavors, this was, uh, 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 that was, um, I will repeat it, the court established the obligation of uh, domestic judges to exercise some kind of judicial uh, review of domestic law in the exercise of their judicial endeavors. This was called the doctrine of the conventionality control. We can see that this new ju judicial doctrine was established by the Inter-American Court observing the open attitude of national constitutions towards international law and particularly the attitude of specific judges of the region that started to enforce these norms and apply uh, the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court. The doctrine of the conventionality control is one of the most effective and recent efforts designed, designed uh, by the court to guarantee the compliance with the American Convention at the domestic level. It was established in 2006 in the case of Almonacid Arellano versus Chile in a case related to amnesties. The court established that even when he was fully aware of the legal constraints in which judges exercise their powers and competences and that they are uh, compelled to follow the internal legal rules, when a state ratifies an international treaty such as the American Convention, their judges as state's authorities remain bound by the international instrument as well. The, this means that they are obligated to provide full effectiveness to the provision of the American Convention and that such effectiveness is not obstructed by applying domestic laws contrary to the object and purpose which should be considered known and avoided. In other words, the court established that the judicial must exercise a conventionality control 
to the domestic legal norms on the basis of the American Convention. It also established that domestic courts will exercise this control has to take into account not only the treaty provision, but also the interpretation rendered by the Inter-American Court. After the decision in the case of Almonacid Arellano, in the case Trabajadores Cesados del Congreso del Perú, dismissed Congressional Employees versus Peru, the court established that the conventionality control has to be exercised ex officio, ex officio, and that the conventionality control was complementary to the constitutionally control. Furthermore, in the case of Cabrera Garcia Montiel Flores versus Mexico in 2010, where I had the opportunity to participate for the first time as judge of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights as an ad hoc judge, the court made a crucial consideration regarding the scope of the conventionality control. It decided that not only judges, but, all, but that all state organs in charge of the administrative, uh, administration of justice at all levels have the obligation to exercise the conventionality control ex officio, including the courts at the highest level of the region, including the courts at the highest level of the regions, that is, Supreme Courts and Constitutional Courts. The case of Hellman versus Uruguay is equally relevant in the development of the conventionality control. That was in 2011. This case involved the existence uh, and enforcement of an amnesty law that had been approved in, on two occasions by a majority of citizens in Uruguay, but that prevented the investigation and punishment of serious violations of human rights committed by members of the military and police forces within the framework of the military dictatorship <laughs> in the country. The Inter-American Court established that there existed incompatibility between the armed amnesty law and the American Convention, which in consequence render, uh, rendered the amnesty law was null and void. The Court did not hesitate in reaffirming that when a state has ratified the American Convention, all its organs, including the state, the judges, are bound by the provision enshrined in the instrument, and the scope of this obligation entails that the effect of the Convention are not to be rendered null by the application of provisions contrary to the object and purpose of the Convention. In this case, the Court firmly established that, even against the general opinion of the citizens, the fundamental and essential values of the American Con Convention, as interpreted, interpreted by the Court, had to be observed and should prevail even against the majority rule. Finally, regarding the conventionality control, three weeks ago, uh, the court decided in the already mentioned the advisory opinion 21, a very important advisory opinion on the rights and guarantees of children in the context, context of migration and or in need for, of international protection, that in the exercise of the conventionality control, states' authorities should take into account the standards developed in advisory opinions, not only in contentious cases, because following these standards allow, especially in a preventive manner, to achieve the effective respect and guarantee of human rights. Besides uh, its practical connotations, it is important to mention that the doctrine of the conventionality control has contributed to the judicial dialogue between the Inter-American Court and domestic tribunals, and in some cases, it has even promoted, promoted a, 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 a structural changes at the domestic level in relation with the mechanism with which the elements of the Inter-American Corpus Juris are incorporated to national laws and judicial practice. I don't have the time to illustrate this phenomenon, maybe in the Q&A questions we can give you some examples of this um, judicial dialogue regarding the conventionality control. As we can see, the conventionality control is a unique phenomenon in the relation between domestic and international courts and tribunals, since there is no similar provision in the European system. The conventionality control constitutes one of the most important elements in the construction of, a, of the Jews Constitutionale Comune 
at least in Latin America, as it operates as a legal institution with the aim to fortify the judicial dialogue among national authorities of state parties to the American Convention and the Inter-American Court, providing common standards on human rights for the entire region. As expressed by Professor Armin von Bogdani, <clears throat> the Jews Constitutionale Commune is based upon the unrestricted respect to human rights, the rule of law, and democracy, and entails a new public legal order in this region. The transformation of the basic structure of public law, a proposal of orientation in the complex current situation. In the same sense, since more than 10 years ago, in an important article about the abolition of death penalty, Notre Dame professor Paolo Carozza suggested that it is good and helpful to think of human rights in terms of a Jewish community as a matter to foster a deeper and genuine universality of human rights founded on the requirements of human dignity. I certainly agree on this position, and I also agree with the view that the proper development of a Jewish community would require a great deal of time, research, and global communication, so we can develop the conceptual and practical tools to build this idea on their solid foundations. This task, I must say, has just started, and is an ongoing process that requires the, the enrollment, not just of course, but also of scholars. Now let's move to the final point, the final part, the third part, ancillary aspects of judicial dialogue. As expressed at the beginning of this lecture, judicial dialogue is a phenomenon arising from the practice of international and domestic courts and tribunals. And one of its most important characteristics is the freedom of participation of different actors. There is not an international code of procedure regulating the communication among courts and tribunals. There is not even a code establishing the existence of an obligation to participate in this dialogue. Indeed, it is true that some courts and tribunals have maintained a close, I can say sometimes a very close attitude to the judicial dialogue. Maybe because those courts consider themselves self-sufficient in the sense that openness towards the exterior might not be relevant or necessary. But it is possible to observe that, in general, at least in Latin America, there is an increasing dialogue taking place among different courts. There is no doubt that the legitimacy and authority of courts and tribunals, whether national or international, is based upon, upon the institution or organ itself, and this does not depend upon <coughs> any other judicial organ. The authority of any court comes from its constitu constitutive in instrument, and of course, any court is in full exercise of this, uh, of this judicial sovereignty, so the recourse to external precedents is a matter of choice. In other words, judicial dialogue is not a condition sine qua non for a court or tribunal to exercise its function with legitimacy. And based on this, it is very important to abstain from judging in abstract the reasons upon which a court or tribunal decides to abstain from uh, taking into account a foreign recourse or decides to do it in a limited manner. Nevertheless, as one of the users of this uh, judicial dialogue, as a judge of a regional court on human rights, I firmly consider that the judicial dialogue has facilitated and promoted a better understanding and construction of the court's jurisprudence, especially in human rights. Judicial dialogue has promoted a comprehensive understanding of the context in which judges operate and to take a different approach of their own jurisprudence, all with the purpose to provide effectiveness of the protection of human rights in the Americas. In this context, one may ask, it is truly possible to ignore the relevant judicial developments just because these developments come from some other court? In other latitudes, judges have ventured in providing better standards for the protection of human rights. So it is reasonable to expect that if a court wants to abstain from considering the interpretation of other judges, they need to adequately explain the situation because certainly 
there might be good reasons for that. However, in my, opi in my opinion, what, do, uh, what has not, what has to be condemned is a close attitude based on judicial narcissism or judicial egotism. As judge of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, it, it is very difficult, almost impossible, to serve effectively in my judicial functions without an open attitude towards judicial developments, whether national or international of human rights in different countries of America. As has been established through the brief recount of this practice, the judicial dialogue has contributed to the institutional development of the Inter-American Court itself. Now let's move to the final remark, the future of the judicial dialogue. As a final remark, I would like to reflect on the future of the judicial dialogue to the international system of human rights based on what we have talked about today. Human rights have two main characteristics that could provide some guidelines about the future on the matter. Progress, uh, progressiveness and universality. Regarding progressiveness, in accordance with other court and tribunals, the Inter-American Court has established that human rights treaties are living instruments and their interpretation has to be made in accordance with their, the times and evolution and living conditions. This interpretation has been fundamental to undertake an open and cosmopolitan spirit towards the sta standards coming from the other ju jurisdiction and in the sense judicial dialogue will be applied and continue to develop in the future. On the other hand, the idea of the universality of human rights and the ways in which judicial dialogue promotes this ideal, ideal constitute a much more complex issue. It is true that at the international level, there is some need to judicial coordination in order to guarantee unity in the application and interpretation of international law. Judicial dialogue is an effort of coordination in its early stage, and that could potentially lead leads towards the construction of a just constitutionale comune in the region. It is still too soon to establish if the judges participating in this enterprise would act in the same way, with the same purposes and normative ends. For instance, procedural law rules that have been established, particularly with respect to the doctrine of the conventionality control and the construction of a just constitutionale comune in Latin America, constitute a regional effort to coordinate the legal actors under the basis of the principle of so, uh, subsidiarity. <coughs> At the present time, it is possible to affirm that the dialogue in the inter-American system has promoted the creation of a common cultural space regarding human rights questions, and space that integrates different levels of protection, universal, international, domestic, and regional, but, but this is a very unique effort in a very specific part of the world. We still need to determine the legal consequences of the, uh, of the dialogue on human rights in a larger scale, and if it, this will contribute to the ideal of universality. We need to remain attentive to the coordination within an African system, which is in the early stage of its judicial activity, and among other courts and tribunals that do not belong to a regional system of human rights, but that from, form, form part of a, a universal system guided by the United Nations. It might be the case that the judicial dialogue between the Inter-American Court, the European Court, and the African Court of uh, Human Rights uh, and People's Rights promotes the establishment of a Jews commune at the universal level, or a Jews commune humanist. Only as time passes, we will know if the effort of the Inter-American Court uh, might contribute might contribute to the creation of a truly global judicial system that allows the creation of har harmonious and well-coordinated relationship between international and domestic law. What is for sure is that in the last years, we have moved towards the creation of a common cultural space that promotes a rich interaction of the constitutional and international jurisprudence based on the minimum protection of the human rights that is required by the principle of human dignity. And I think that judges, domestic or international, have been very important actors in the creation 
of this cultural space in human rights. With this in mind, at the end, the, exhaust, the, the success and consolidation of this idea will depend on the attitude of the judges, since the development and integration of international law rests upon them. What is clear for me, however, is that what must be at the center, at the center of the judicial dialogue and in general, about the development of human rights standards is the protection and promotion of human dignity. Thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you very much, Judge Ferrer McGregor, for a magisterial uh, and comprehensive presentation of a topic of growing importance. Um, we do have time for some questions. Uh, Aida? Uh, yes, thank you very much for the lecture. I have very many questions, but I don't want to bother everybody with mm -hmm. the little questions I have. Um, in your lecture, you said that, like, especially then, you said that, um, that the goal is basically the global system and the global approach to human rights. And therefore, I have a question. Uh, how do uh, you overcome the differences in approaches, especially European courts, human rights? It has, um, the philosophy behind it is quite different from philosophy from inter-American court. And um, do you think that there might be any problems in different ideas behind the court itself? And from here, there's another question is, uh, do we really need a global system? Because the idea of regional system that it responds to the problems existing in the region, precisely like you mentioned, for disappearances in the past, and Europe dealing with the different problems. Uh, so I think those are two main questions. Thank you. Filosofías distintos entre yes. el sistema europeo y internacional y también problemas distintos en las dos regiones. Y por eso, ¿por qué se necesita un sistema global? La armonía global es sí. mejor armonía regional para reflejar las diferencias. Yes, I want to complicate, uh, bueno, uh, voy a tratar de uh, hablar entre español y. Uh, I think, um, I really think that we're in an early stage right now. As I said at the beginning of the presentation, at the end of our presentation, I, I want to concentrate it in the internet and system. But of course, there are particulars in human rights around the world. And maybe we, we can uh, imagine new actors in this judicial dialogue. No? For example, no, I was writing just be, be, before the, I was coming to this presentation, um, the systems like the national and Arabian country, I, th I think, well, it's not far away. It was far away, the international criminal court. No, 15 years ago, not 20 years ago, an international criminal court. Well, why not? Maybe an international court of human rights. They are working right now in a project. No? And that will be a challenge. An international court in human rights. Well, that would be, we were discussing this uh, issue the other day. You know. I really believe that we have to continue developing this uh, stretchiness of human rights. You know. It's difficult, I know. I don't have the answer. I don't have the answer. Maybe you, you will have it better than I. But I think there, there, is, a increase, there is increasing the spaces for dialogue are being expanded in, in all the in todo lo que? In, todos los ámbitos, in, in all spheres of international law. And yes, podría dar una oportunidad that will bring, will bring an opportunity to uh, create more spaces, both official spaces, organs, uh, algunos organs uh, que puedan promover que se concrete la posibilidad de pensar o que la, el principio de universalidad pueda realmente concretar. There are more and more organs that are being established that can promote the principle of universality and put it into practice. But that is very complicated 
And I, maybe in the center is just right now human decision. Here. Uh, thank you, Professor Ferrer. Uh, I was thinking, I, I find it very interesting the, that you value the, 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 the discrepancy that you stressed and underlined that, that discrepancies are good in this dialogue. And I was wondering, more than in, in broad terms of the instances of dialogue that you quoted, how do you see the constitution? You mentioned also the constitutionalization of international human rights law in the region, and you brought the example of Argentina. And how do you, it seems to me that uh, at least the example of Argentina and other forms of constitution, constitutionalization of, of human rights law in the region are efforts that respond to atrocities in the past of violations of human rights. But on the other hand, when we talk about judicial dialogue, um, it seems to me that it could be more an obstacle uh, than, than help, because having the provisions as bounding in the constitution of national judges, there is very little room uh, for discrepancy and for fostering um, a dialogue in the sense of exchanging, not just adopting uh, from the, 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 the inter-American court uh, below, <coughs> from below, uh, uh, so I don't know if my question is. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Why an obstacle? An obstacle, uh, I would say an obstacle because I see uh, um, with constitutional provisions in our legal systems in Latin America, bounding the, the national judges, they will have very little room for, uh, for developing their own interpretation, a more generous interpretation, or just a different interpretation than the interpretation of the Inter-American court. Uh, I see that as an obstacle um, mm -hmm. for the discrepancy that, that you value. Thinking of the discrepancy as something uh, something positive in terms of legal pluralism and, and the global in, in, in the same instance of globalization of, of human rights that, mm -hmm. that you mentioned. Well, thank you that you mentioned discrepancies and not conflicts. No, I don't like conflicts. No, and I think it's uh, like in in my court. No, we we don't have conflicts. We have different opinions. No. So we both, and I think that happens uh, in any legal interpretation. No? But I think um, it's, uh, it's not being understood very well the, the doctrine of the conventionality control. I didn't have time to mention, but it is a very important uh, clarifi clarification of what I, uh, I said in my presentation, that uh, uh, this doctrine um, does not try to impose a homogeneous perspective of the interpretation of human rights. No? That's very important, no? because I have to apply the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court. Yes, but uh, we, you have to understand that that is, that is the less interpretation to give effectiveness of the American Convention. That is a treaty that has to be applied by the, the state. No? So um, the pro-persona principle and the logic of normative pluralism is in the genesis of this doctrine. No, I don't believe in her uh, hierarchies, hierarchies. I don't believe in hierarchies in human rights. I believe in the most protection of human rights. No? What would be the most protection in a concrete case? Maybe the jurisprudence of the court is not the best answer. The jurisprudence of the court will maybe it will have it, you will have it in the uh, domestic level. No, in the, the jurisprudence of the court is not uh, pretend in, by this uh, conventional control that uh, the judges um, close their eyes and just apply the jurisprudence of the court. No, the conventional control promotes the dialogue to see which uh, is the best. Uh, protection for that case in particular. Article 29 of the American Convention um, per, uh, permits, uh, allows to apply national norms. 
So I don't see why it could be an obstacle because the jurisprudence of the court is not an imposition. It's a, you, you have to dialogue with the court to see if that is the, 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 the interpretation of the American Convention by the court is the best interpretation that you can do it in a particular case at a domestic level. <coughs> in Mexico, um, just some months ago, uh, they move on and says that the jurisprudence of the court is uh, binding, no? but only if it's superior or if it's uh, superior the protection of the human rights. It's not binding in other cases. If we can't um, have a best interpretation at the, the local um, domestic uh, um, interpretation, a domestic judge, well, that's the correct answer for me. No? I, I, I don't know if I, uh, if, if, if your question was like, uh, I don't know where, why is an obstacle. That's why I, uh, I asked you at the beginning. No? I would have follow up questions, but I don't know if, hmm. the other people. if I may just comment. I think it's a one way obstacle. <laughs> In other words, a national court cannot give less protection <laughs> than the Inter American Court, but it can give more based on its own constitution. <coughs> and so, particularly with the number of recent decisions by the court, the Inter American Court, where some of us think the protection was not enough, uh, there's room for national courts to give a higher level of protection. That's it. <laughs> Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Yes, Michelle. Oh, it's a question of methodology, so perhaps someone can ask a more specific well, we'll take two questions then, but methodology <laughs> is important. Go ahead. Uh, when you talk about the different levels of intensity, um, what was the methodology behind it? Because I, I saw that Canada, for example, was at the lowest level. Um, so what were you... Was it only cita like citation use of inter-American cases, or... Was it a broader definition? No. Uh, I use, well, what countries have signed the American Convention? The American Convention is the heart of the system. No? It's the heart of the system. <coughs> and there's 10 countries that haven't signed the American Convention. Of course, that's at the lowest uh, level of, uh, of uh, there, is, there is judicial data. Not is uh, is not just uh, in the, in, the, in these ten cases in these ten countries Canada United States and other Caribbean uh, countries. Uh, for example, in the, in the last advisory opinion, the last advisory opinion, as you all know, uh, all the 35 states of the um, uh, organization of the American states can uh, apply for the advisory opinion. Can apply for the advisory opinion, and. Uh, the Inter-American Court, well, yes, knowing that, we, uh, we use a lot, not the American Convention, but the Declaration, the American Declaration uh, that was before the American Convention. That's why uh, this is a, 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 a low value with the court, because we just can use the advisory opinions. No? But there isn't any contentious cases. So the methodology was, first, what were the countries that had signed the American Convention? Second, what were the countries that had signed the American Convention and had recognized the compulsory jurisdiction of the courts? That's another level, no? of course, because there can be cases at the courts. It's not the same uh, United States than uh, Peru or Argentina that can be at the courts. No? that can be part of one case at the court, that can indi an individual can switch a state, uh, the commission, and then goes to the court. You know. And the other uh, element, or element is what uh, countries had denied the American Convention. You know, that, that's the, the big picture you know, of that. But, in these 20 levels of the maximum 20 states that are the states that are, had already signed the American Convention, that recognize the uh, jurisdiction of the court, the compulsory of the jurisdiction of the court, in those we can't move, and I have a classification of other type of uh, yeah. dialogue no? in these 20 states. No? 
It depends if they have, they have hierarchy of the treaties or in human rights. It, some of them they can use uh, they can uh, the hierarchy of the treaty can be higher of the American Convention in some times, no? but they accept it. No? So that, that was the classification that I did. No? But Michelle, when you go back to Canada, you can fix this. <laughs> you can help move Canada up to a higher level. <laughs> I think there's a question over here in the center. No? Uh, yes. Oh. Uh, I want to insist in Aida's second question. Um, do we need, or better, do we want in this issue, uh, human rights issue, uh, a international global court knowing that um, we have very different uh, problems or issues related with human rights in every country? I think yes. I don't know when this can happen. I don't know if, it, if there are conditions to happen. But that's another thing. No? But yes, I think yes, we can move on. There's different views of human rights in all the world. It's true. Even in a same region system of human rights, the countries can have different views of human rights. But we're all human beings. And we have the same problems. And there are similar problems in all the world. In, the, in all the world. Of course, there are cultural uh, spaces. But I think, and that's why they're working right now in a project, a pre project. I don't know if it's a pre 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 project. <laughs> I don't know if it, in, in what stage is it right now. Maybe you. Uh, I, I think it's a pre 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 pre. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that happened also. For the, as I said, for the International Criminal Court. Someone says that's a crazy idea. And now it's in function. It's a very hard question. I don't know the answer. If I may just comment, having a global human rights regime or a global human rights court does not mean a straitjacket with the same answer to the same case in every country in the world because uh, many human rights are stated in terms of there is a right subject to exceptions, what is necessary in a democratic society. And courts can take into account differences in countries in deciding the extent of restrictions. So even in Europe, where you've got one European convention for the whole region and one European court for the whole region, the European court does not necessarily impose the same exact result in every country. It depends a bit on the circumstances of the country. So it's not as if we all have to move to complete homogeneity to have a universal system of human rights. Can I add something? Of course, you're the speaker. The European, <laughs> the European system, 47 countries, no? and the, well, the, I, I, I can't imagine being a judge in the, inter, in the European system. No? It's, I think it's easier in the, Europe in the Inter American system because only twenty states, twenty two states, no? And they well it's very similar cultural, no? But in forty seven states with a, a lot of spaces of uh, cultural differences of cultural and that's why they are moving. They used but now it's a new protocol, the protocol what is fifteen or sixteen that uh, they're kind of it's open to sign it for signature for signature, uh, signature uh, for the margin of appreciation national of appreci uh, appreciation nacional. margin of appreciation and the margin of appreciation which the European court uses is another way to give some flexibility well thank you all and thank you especially Judge Federer and my great We are all invited to a sumptuous reception. Before we go, just one. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, we, before we begin our uh, lovely eating and drinking, we want to finally um, present uh, Judge Ferrer with a, with a gift for his time here. Something to remember the CCHR box.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. The reception is where? Please join us once again just upstairs in the Act of Commons. Very good.